The words that people tend to use these days is interspiritual or spiritually independent or spiritual but not religious. And many young people feel very attracted to that. For me, spir spiritual just really points to being in touch with our roots, the deep stuff in our hearts. And so the practices are there to help us touch those places within ourselves. And also to connect with something that holds it all, which for me, as a Christian, is God. But in terms of religion versus non-religious spirituality, I think the difficulty is that I'm seeing in people who are kind of following a post-religious or interspiritual path. I wrote a book encouraging people to do that. So I'm also very much aware of my responsibility. That conversation has been going for a very long time, but when I look at people who try to practice outside of the tradition versus people who enter the tradition, it seems to me oftentimes that people who enter the tradition tend to make more progress. And the reason for that is not necessarily because the churches or whoever else have all the keys. I mean, the church is pretty messed up. A lot of our institutional traditions are, I dare to say, spiritually bankrupt. But there are still treasures there as well. And I think that one of the treasures is the, the maps and the practices. And I think that in these kinds of post-religious circles, people oftentimes pick and choose things from different traditions. And what that means is that sometimes they can't really go beyond just exploring basic questions. And I think within the religious traditions, you see that people kind of just accept a map and then start with a practice. And I think that that generates progress, whether it's a Buddhist tradition or a Christian tradition or a Sufi tradition. And that's why I think it's very important for those groups to be in deep conversation, because those maps can also be passed on to the post-religious world. You know, Bonhoeff would be uh, one person who possibly would encourage something like that. I don't have any illusions about the church or the religious traditions, but I think that they still have some treasures worth connecting with, especially around practice and around a framework for what a mature spiritual life looks like and what are the stages of spiritual life. Uh, in some of my work with young people, you know, I see that people adopt a practice and they go through this kind of very romantic stage where they feel in love with the divine and it's just a lot of joy and they love, you know, getting up at 4 a.m. and practicing and, and then something happens after a couple of years and they hit a dry period. And that's when they often feel that they need to change a teacher or change a tradition or change the practice. And then they start kind of shopping around and sometimes get lost. Now, if you're in touch with the mystical traditions, if you know, for example, someone like St. John of the Cross, you understand that that experience of dryness might actually be a sign of progress. Because according to St. John of the Cross, that means that you're being invited to go deeper and that the divine is present but your spiritual senses to recognize that presence haven't yet developed. And there are specific practices then that are a specific way of being that is assigned to you to develop those spiritual senses. So you see, that's why I think it's important to, to be a student of traditions, not in terms of just book knowledge, but to actually have relationships with real mentors who have gone into some of those traditions and can speak uh, of their experience of what it's about. Father Beat Griffiths, uh, whom I've actually not met in person, he died before I was even able to speak English. <laughs> I was still in my late teens when he died. But his writings have been very influential in my life. They helped me to trust that this intuition that was attracting me to contemplation is real 
and he also helped me to reconcile East with West in terms of Eastern and Western spirituality and those different emphasis, how they can work together. So I've been blessed to have relationships and to receive mentorship from some of his students, people like Vandana Mataji, who was a hermit sister in India, or Brother Francis and Sister Michaela, or Angie Harvey, uh, or Brother Wayne Teasdale, or some of the other people, other people who, uh, who really carried his spirit. You know, both Matthew Fox and Angie Harvey have been very supportive of my work and have been real elders in my life, helping me to kind of give that dangerous permission to trust how I was experiencing God in my life. Rabbi Yehuda Fine really initiated me into what I would call the mysticism of the streets with this very wise Hasidic wisdom of being sent into some of the darkest places to look for sparks of life that were assigned to me for me to raise them up. That was a very influential relationship. There have been many many other teachers that have just been very gracious and kind and supportive and I would be lost without them. The book New Monasticism uh, emerged out of a friendship and conversations with my co-author Rory McEntee and it was really a sacred experience. We spent a couple of years talking almost every day and the framework just kind of emerged out of our conversations. We both felt that we were naming something that, that needed to be named, not even for other people, but for our own lives. And initially we uh, created this document, a PDF document that was written for a gathering with Father Thomas Keating, the Trappist monk and a great, really Christian mystic who was very interested in new monasticism and was very supportive of of new monasticism. So we sent the document to a few people and one Sufi teacher decided to post it on his website. And after a day, if I remember correctly, he emailed us saying over a thousand people downloaded the document. And then within like a week or so, we started receiving uh, messages from all over the world, someone translated it into Spanish, saying how this names something for them, that this is what they've been living, but this gives them the language. And this was both people who were monastics, who lived in monasteries, from hermits to people who had kind of more active religious lives, uh, and also from people who were kind of on the outskirts of our traditions, who wanted to commit their lives to practice. And we were approached by Orbis Books to expand it into a book, which we welcomed that opportunity, and we worked on it for, for a little bit. A lot of that work really happened over a decade ago. It's important to qualify because now we've had a decade of people actually working with that book. I stand by most of the things in that book. New monasticism is a real thing. I'm still involved in new monasticism. So many people feel to have a contemplative life in the world where action and contemplation can meet. So many people feel that they want to pursue their spiritual journey outside of the religious or organized religion. I support that, even as a priest. I think what I would engage with differently would be this. Even though we say that this demands serious practice, that this demands serious discernment, that you can't really do this without proper mentors, without being situated in a community, this is not an individualistic journey. Especially in the US, which is a very kind of individualistic country, many people still try to do it on their own. Do yourself spirituality. And so I think that if I were to work on that book again, I would actually give uh, some more parameters for how to practice this, for how to find a mentor, 
for what a healthy community looks like, for what are the practices. And also tell people to be discerning and cautious about following this path outside of the established traditions because if they feel called to do that, that means that they will be co-creating that path. And that means that they really have to have good mentors, that they have to be part of a community that can invite them into this experience of learning how to be vulnerable, learning how to receive feedback. In a spiritual life, it's so easy to make mistakes when we just rely on our inner guidance. I mean, so many things can go wrong. Inner guidance, or in a Christian tradition, what we call the guidance of the Holy Spirit is very important. But all of that is meant to be then brought into one's spiritual director, into one's community, where people can authenticate what you're receiving or sometimes critique it. And I think that's very healthy. And so I would add more on that. But I think the book as a whole, I think, still works to some extent. And I still receive messages from people who, who have read it and felt uh, inspired by it. And, and I'm grateful that I was able to participate in the writing of that book with Rory McEntee, who is also a great theologian. You know, his gifts are so also evident in that book. My advice for anyone who wishes to practice deeply would be to adopt a practice that gives them a sense of connectedness to the sacred, to the presence. Number two, it would be to get a psychotherapist who can help them to make sure that they are not using their spiritual practice to bypass their trauma, their wounds. Number three would be to invite them into a community uh, of like-minded people where people commit to a specific rule of life, to honesty, uh, to being with each other in a way that helps them to learn how to be vulnerable, that helps them to learn how to confess their shortcomings, that helps them to learn how to offer or receive forgiveness. So those would be my three kind of basics. And then, of course, uh, eventually one needs some kind of a spiritual teacher or a tradition that can guide them or a spiritual director.